everyone and thank you for joining us for this webinar today. And um, this afternoon, this webinar is going to last for approximately 60 minutes and we'll be talking about pressure ulcer prevention in adult social care in conjunction with NICE guidelines and best practice recommendations. So just a few bits of housekeeping before we start. This is being recorded and the recording of the webinar will be made available afterwards. There is a chat function on the right, which I think most of you have discovered. But just please be aware that if you're going to share contact details or anything like that, then everybody will be able to see it. So moving on to introductions. My name is Nicola Payne and I am a care home nurse specialist working across Nottinghamshire for an organisation called Men's Health Partners. So I work closely with the local authority on a number of projects involving the independent care sector. One of my jobs is to devise and deliver training to social care providers and I have previously been involved in a number of pressure ulcer prevention projects locally. Today I'll be talking about the NICE guidelines and the standards and the quality statements and how these can be implemented in practice. Hi there, I'm Liz Norton, I'm a Training, Learning and Development Manager from Church Farm Care, who are based uh, in Nottingham. Uh, we have four nursing homes um, in the area and I deliver training for um, all staff and this includes um, some pressure and prevention training. I'll be talking today about the training that we provide within our organisation and also linking with what Nicola will be talking about, about the NICE guidelines and the standards as well, so welcome. Hi, my name is Gwyn Williams. I'm the clinical lead at Rusticus within Church Farm Care. My main role is to ensure that we offer good quality holistic care and that is delivered to all of our residents. And we make sure that our staff are trained in all aspects of that care. I have recently uh, been uh, taken part in an international piece of work where one element focused on pressure ulcer prevention. And I will be talking about the care we provide in our nursing home. Hopefully you've all had a chance to read the overview of this webinar on the original invite, but over the next hour we will be discussing the key recommendations from the guideline on pressure ulcer prevention, an overview of the quality standard and how providers can implement the standard in practice. Hopefully you've been able to familiarise yourself with these documents from NICE. The guidelines are all transferable to all aspects of care, including nursing homes, residential homes and domiciliary care organisations, although some aspects will only be relevant to one sector, and the main focus of this webinar will be to care home managers with nursing. NICE published best practice guidelines and standards after reviewing the evidence on a particular topic. This is usually done in collaboration with health and social care professionals using a multidisciplinary approach. The Pressure Ulcer Prevention and Management Clinical Guideline was released in April 2004. It had been reviewed in November 2018 and no new evidence was found to change the recommendation. You can use the links to click to find these, the NICE guidance. CQC look to ensure providers are meeting the regulated activities as set out in the Health and Social Care Act 2008. Regulation 12, Safe Care and Treatment, is intended to prevent people from receiving unsafe care and treatment and prevent avoidable harm or risk of harm. Providers must assess the risks to people's health and safety during any care or treatment and make sure that staff have the qualifications, competence, skills and experience to keep people safe. 
there is more information available on the TTC website. There has been a huge amount of work undertaken recently over preventing pressure pulses in social care settings. Reducing the number of patients with a stage 2, 3 or 4 pressure ulcer was one element of reducing avoidable harm in the NHS Outcomes Framework 2014-15. Recent figures suggest that 1,300 new ulcers are reported each month and over £1.4 million pounds is spent every day treating pressure ulcers. Over this webinar, we will be discussing practical elements to the guidelines, providing safe, efficient and effective care, whilst keeping the person at the centre of the picture at all times. During the webinar, you'll have a chance to ask questions in the chat function and we'll be able to stop throughout to review these questions and we'll also allow some time at the end to go over anything. The NICE guidelines on pressure rules of prevention and management identify key principles for its implementation. This includes Risk assessment of pressure ulcers for adults, adult skin assessment, care planning for all ages, reconditioning for adults, devices for prevention of pressure ulcers for adults, healthcare professional training and education for all ages, and management of heel pressure ulcers for adults. There are some recommendations that relate to children and young people, but because we will only be talking about adults, we will not relate to these during this webinar. We'll be using the quality statement QS89 to go through what we do in practice and also what the recommendations from NICE are. Quality Statement 1 advises that people who are admitted to hospital or a care home with nursing have a pressure ulcer risk assessment within six hours of admission. This is based on recommendations from the guidelines 1.4.2 and 1.1.3. An assessment of pressure ulcers risk should be based on clinical judgment and or the use of a validated scale, such as the Braden scale or the Waterloo scale. This can include looking at somebody's limited mobility, loss of sensation, history of previous or current pressure ulcer, malnutrition, the inability to reposition themselves, or significant cognitive impairment. The six hour time frame was reached by expert consensus and remains valid and supported by Wounds UK. Um, within the care home that I work in, um, we, um, when people are admitted, we immediately do a grade, we use the Braden risk assessment tool and we, we, we do the Braden straight away. Um, at nurses and then we review them every month. Um, often the care, the care staff throughout the shift will be um, monitoring skin integrity um, during personal care so people's skin are, is actually checked quite regularly throughout the day and if they've got any concerns then we will speak to the nurse staff. Um, we record all um, any damage to skin on body charts on a, on a nourish care planning device that we use um, and we put, put the Braden, the Braden is actually on the um, nourish care planning device too. There's also the SQ 
skin bundle, which is used widely across Nottinghamshire. And this is a quick way that helps individuals to recognise somebody's risk and what action needs to be taken when looking at pressure rules of prevention. So this involves looking at the surface, the skin inspection, encouraging people to keep moving, assessing somebody's incontinence needs, and also looking at their nutrition. Um, I would also say that um, obviously because we are relying on um, all staff to be um, assessing uh, people's skin, the, the, uh, the training of staff, uh, particularly at induction, um, is hugely important. Um, and actually using the um, reactor to red that has been um, used widely in, in Nottinghamshire as part of the East Midlands Academic Health Science Network, um, <coughs> has had a massive um, effect on how we've trained our staff. Um, at induction, all staff watch um, the uh, Reactor Red DVD, <coughs> and we've also just introduced the Reactor Moisture um, uh, teaching pack as well. Um, um, and that includes actually our kitchen staff and our housekeeping staff, um, as really everybody needs a basic awareness of uh, the importance of skin integrity. Um, and so the importance of the nutrition and fluids, particularly for the kitchen staff, is important, but also for the housekeeping staff to notice if a piece of equipment is uh, malfunctioning or, or got a warning sign on it or something like that. Um, it's, uh, it's called the Tissue, Bit of, tissue by a Bit of the Champions. Uh, courses and training that is provided uh, by Knott's Healthcare um, as well, so that in each of the homes uh, we will encourage them to access that training. Um, really, just you know, to raise everybody's awareness, and so they're actually working as a team um, and all working with the same uh, purpose. Um, uh, the Reactor Red, particularly, has been uh, really useful. Um, I think on the NHS, uh, stop the pressure. Uh, they also uh, refer to that. Um, it, should, it should be something we're very proud of in the East Midlands. Um, that's really, really good. Um, like I say, all staff attend that training as um, part of their induction. Um, and then throughout their journey working with us, um, uh, we also encourage that uh, continual learning to um, uh, take place, accessing um, uh, training that's uh, on in the area as well. So, for those that are living in a residential care home setting, people who have been identified as having one of the risk factors for developing a pressure ulcer should be referred to a community nursing service and have a pressure ulcer risk assessment undertaken at the first face to face visit. And that would apply to those also accessing domiciliary care workers. Um, they would then contact the community nursing services for further advice and further assessment. Those service users who are already accessing community nursing services will have had their pressure ulcer risk assessment completed and that will be care planning. So it's always good if you can talk to community nursing teams to understand what pressure ulcer risk assessment they've completed and what prevention techniques they're going to be using. Quality Statement 3 is looking at based on is based on recommendations 1.1.4 and it's about people having a risk of developing pressure ulcers, their risk reassessed after a surgical or interventional procedure or after a change in their care environment following transfer. So this is usually applicable to care settings when somebody has been discharged from hospital. So it's important to recognise that a person's risk of developing a pressure ulcer can change over time and that whilst the person has been usually cared for in a hospital setting, they will have had their pressure ulcer status assessed and 
documented and cared for. But if a person's health deteriorates, then they should also be reassessed and it shouldn't be waiting for the um, monthly reassessment to take place. Um, in, in our care homes, we do reassess monthly um, risk assessments, but um, we, we do, as people deteriorate, we will reassess as, as and when needed. Um, we also do reassess people when, they come, when they've been living with us and have to go into hospital and then come back. We always reassess straight away because often we find that people who haven't, didn't have any pressure damage or problems before going into hospital often come back with um, sort of either pressure damage or have got red and areas. And then, then we can just um, develop an action plan of how we're going to help that person. Quality statement four looks at people having had a skin assessment if they're identified as high risk of developing pressure ulcers. One of the things that we found globally in practice is that a lot of our service users and residents will be at some risk of developing a pressure ulcer. So it's really important that they have that skin assessment carried out at various interventions throughout the day. So that could include when somebody's being assisted to use the toilets, getting dressed, changing clothing. And a skin assessment in adults should take into account any pain or discomfort reported by the individual skin integrity in areas of pressure, colour changes or discoloration, and variation in heat, firmness and moisture. For example, because of incontinence, edema, dry or inflamed skin. Within our care setting, we care for people who um, are living with a de dementia illness. Um, and, I, and I feel very much that cognitive impairment also impacts on people's pressure in pressure areas um, because people are able to maybe speak out and say that they're in pain or discomfort and so they those people do rely upon staff particularly more so than other, than all the people who are able to get up and move around independently and that they're able to say that they're in pain we do so obviously we take special we take special care and attention of those people who aren't able to speak up for themselves um, by developing a plan to reposition them quite frequently or remind them to stand up and walk around uh, because often they may just sit there and not move. An acronym has been developed to help people complete a skin assessment called BEST SHOT. So it breaks the body down into specific areas that are usually high risk of developing pressure ulcers. So this includes the buttocks, the elbows and ears, the sacrum, the trochanters or hips, spine and shoulders, heels, the occipital area, which is the back of the head, and also the toes. So it's important that staff are trained which areas of the body to check the skin. Um, that fits quite nicely again with the um, uh, reactor red um, uh, learning that they do within um, the induction process. Um, and it's also revisited. So as part of uh, reactor red that goes through um, uh, best shot there is also a competency assessment um, for the S skin or S skin um, part of it back in practice so although the staff do um, uh, watch the DVD of reactor red in the first instance uh, the learning doesn't stop there and actually when they work with their buddies and mentors back in the um, uh, back in the workplace, uh, they uh, they actually go over that again and are are assessed as part of um, 
uh, their competency assessment uh, so that um, acronym again was best shot so that is B for buttocks, E for elbows or ears, S for sacrum, T for trochanthus or hips, S for spine, shoulders, H for heels, O for occipital area and T for toes. Um, and it's a really important message for all of the care staff um, to get so they are they're actually looking in all the right places. Quality Statement 5 is based on the NICE recommendations 1.1.8 and 1.1.9. People who are at risk of developing pressure ulcers should receive advice on the benefits of frequency of repositioning. So repositioning is about where somebody moves into a different position in a chair or a bed with the aim of reducing or stopping the pressure on the area at risk. So to improve the experience for individuals, health and social care professionals should be advising people at the risk of developing pressure ulcers or their carers as appropriate about the importance of frequent repositioning and that it may be able to help prevent pressure ulcers. The frequency of repositioning depends on the individual and their wants, needs and wishes. But for safety reasons, repositioning is recommended at least every six hours for adults at risk and for every four hours for adults at high risk. Um, I'd also like to say at that point that um, it's also it's really important to, to make sure that uh, loved ones and relatives and the person themselves are aware of why repositioning is so important. Um, and I know that certainly within our care environment, we are not adverse to allowing um, you know, relatives and loved ones to access some training that will help them understand um, you know, what their loved one is going through. Um, and it also means that we're all working together with the same reason. And I think what we're all alluding to is that if you know why you're doing something, then it makes much more sense when uh, people are trying to encourage you to do something, if you know the underlying reasons why. And that also goes for um, the relatives, because sometimes they don't understand that um, the full picture of why it's important to encourage somebody to move about. So, so actually training not just for staff sometimes, but also for uh, you know, the people who are the loved ones that are coming as well. Would you say, Wayne? Would you say that's true? Yes, yeah. it is very yeah. true. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. I, I just I noticed that there's a question there, Sir Simon. Um, repositioning, I think, is recommended at least every six hours for adults at risk and every four hours for adults at high risk. Hopefully, that answers your question. I think the important thing to remember as well is patient choice and individual choice. So we've had cases where people, despite knowing the risks of their pressure ulcer status and that they're going to be high risk of developing a pressure ulcer, there are times when they don't want to move or they don't want to be in a particular position and they're well aware and well informed of the risks. And we do as much as we can to educate them and involve a range of professionals in that process but they still they have the capacity to make that decision and are aware of the risks associated with it. So they might not always be repositioned as per the recommendations. Because we um, because we care for people particularly who with um, dementia type illnesses, our our care plan and system nourish blanks up for individuals each for each individual like sort of timings and repositionings so that staff, care staff are absolutely sure when somebody needs repositioning or helping to stand to relieve the pressure or repositioning in bed, turning and tilting, lifting the hip off the bed. Um, it does actually flag up and they have to 
comment to say on the Nourish device to say that they've actually done that, which is really it, which is really good because then we can, as nursing staff, we can go back and look to make sure that the care has been given in the appropriate way and that that has been done in a timely, timely manner. There's some discussion about the hours in terms of repositioning some people and the, the recommendations have come from nights for the six hours and four hours for adults at high risk. But I'm aware that in many settings we are repositioning people between two and four hourly, depending on the pressure rules and conventional equipment we've got in place and obviously what's deemed necessary for that individual. So it is down to the person and the care that they require at that time these guidelines are just from the NICE recommendations. Quality Statement 6 talks about the, the people who are at risk of developing pressure ulcers and are unable to reposition themselves are helped to change position. So this will include looking at things like the 30 degree tilt and also the use of offloading heels, so using devices to offload heels or things under the legs to make sure that the heels are free from pressure. Again, when we when we think about the 30 degree tilt, again, it's an integral part of the reactor ed um, training. Again, the uh, care staff and nurses are uh, taught and gone over within their induction process, um, and and they also practice it often as well. Um, and uh, you know, it is a, a hugely important. Um, uh, piece of uh, work to go away with to uh, understand and um, you know used a lot like you say we can't um, uh, like that as well but you know it's really good yeah I've just seen a question about people who are at the end of life I think it's really really important that people who are on that end of life care journey are still have repos still have repositioning factored into their care plan it might not be as frequent as for somebody else, but what they're still at risk of developing a pressure ulcer, and it's really important that we do everything we can to try and prevent that person from developing a pressure ulcer, particularly at the end of life. Would you say that you still? Yes, and I would agree with that. We we in the care home we we still reposition people who are at end of life. Um, Yes, they are on the appropriate equipment, such as a as a, as a, a high risk mattress. Um, but we still definitely reposition them, um, just because it's good practice and it it shows to the fact actually it shows we feel it shows to the families as well that you're still caring for their relative, for their loved one. Um, I think if you were just to leave them alone for over four or five hours, then maybe the families would think that you were caring for their, their loved one as well as what you ought to be. So we do continue to reposition at regular intervals. And for those on end of life, if they are exper experiencing high levels of pain with repositioning, obviously that's assessed at the same time and their pain is managed appropriately yeah. Yeah. with the um, end of life. Yes. Yes. And anticipatory medication. One of the other things about uh, teaching care staff is when you're repositioning somebody is to make sure that you document uh, on a turn chart that position um, so that people coming in to do the next change are able to see what position and slide they've already been on and so that they can alternate these effectively. Quality Statement 7 is about people who are at high risk of developing pressure ulcers and their carers receive information on how to prevent them. And this is based on recommendation 1.3.2. And we know that many pressure ulcers are preventable and much of the preventative care needed takes place in a person's own home, be that a care home or their own physical residence. And it needs to be delivered regularly to ensure patient safety. So 
that we should be giving people and their carers as much information as possible about preventative care. And I know Liz has already touched on that about helping relatives to access training to understand why we do what we do. And also this helps to improve the patient experience. Information about preventing pressure ulcers obviously should be appropriate to the individual person and their carers and there's a whole range of resources available that help people um, to access this form of information. People should also be informed about how to use equipment that may be supplied and what people can do to help prevent pressure ulcers from developing. So this will go back to the S skin. So that's looking at people's continence needs, um, assessing their nutrition and explaining to people how their diet can impact on their skin integrity. Obviously there's the keeping moving and then also looking at ways of how people can help with that skin inspection process or if you're a domiciliary care provider, then different tools and techniques um, Locally in the area, we had one care home using mirrors. They issued mirrors to their staff so that they could check the heels much easier than bending down on the floor where the people were sat in the chairs to look for heels and go around. That's a really good idea because it is difficult yeah. to look at somebody's heel and you have to get right on your knees while somebody's holding the leg up. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Thank you, Nicola. <laughs> Um, I noticed somebody just asked about um, Reactor Red and the Reactor Moisture DVDs. Um, if you go to the NHS Stop the Pressure uh, website, there is some information on there um, as well uh, about accessing that. And also there is some information on the East Midlands Academic Health Science Network. Um, they're developing a range of reactive resources and the information can be found there. So quality statement eight is about people who are at high risk of developing pressure ulcers are provided with pressure redistribution devices. And this is based on recommendations 1.1.30, and 1.1.17. So we know that pressure redistribution devices work by reducing or redistributing the pressure, friction or shear forces. And devices include high specification mattresses, pressure redistribution cushions, and equipment that will offload heel pressure. The type of device that a person needs will depend on their circumstances, for example, their mobility, the results of the skin assessment, their level of risk, and the site that's at risk, the person's weight, and the person's general health. Using pressure redistribution devices as soon as possible can help prevent pressure ulcers from developing and help to treat them if they do arise, ensuring, ensuring patient safety and improving the experience of people at high risk of pressure ulcers. So there's a whole host of pressure relieving devices that are used. Um, and some of the airflow mattresses or airway mattresses um, require the weight to be set uh, so it's really important that people are weighed and that the mattress settings are correct. The boxes can be knocked by housekeepers when they're cleaning or people as they brush past them. So it's really important to try and build the check-in of that device um, into the daily practice of people. Can I just put in there, uh, we um, do a, an airflow mattress check within our care homes um, monthly and we record that on our care planning device so because we've found in the past like Nicola has said that mattresses like plugs get knocked out or might or things stop working and also it is a really it's really good practice uh, because the last over the last few years um, the quality auditing teams from the CCG and from social care and CQC have asked for airflow mattress 
readings or checks um, to ensure that we are using the correct settings for for the person's weight in conjunction with their weight. One of the homes that I worked with on a particular project was to try and reduce the, the number of pressure ulcers they had within their care setting. And one of the things that they did was to create some cards that went on the inside of the wardrobe doors in residents' bedrooms, which detailed all the pressure relieving equipment that that individual should have. If they had a mattress, what weight setting that should be on, so that people knew that, and particularly if agency staff were on, they could just check behind the door, see that the person should have a cushion or they should have heel protectors on, and everybody knew to go there to check whether that person's pressure relieving um, needs were being met. Um, that's, I, I sound like I'm selling reactor red DVDs here <laughs> uh, for training. I, I personally found, I've been training for a long time, and I've found the reactor red um, DVD invaluable, particularly for building on that sort of uh, knowledge for everybody, so that everybody has got a very basic understanding of you know what the equipment is, where it is, what it looks like, what checks to do. You know, just making sure that a phone mattress isn't split, uh, a phone cushion isn't split, and that it goes from one chair to another. Really simple, basic things that can actually make huge differences um, to people who are at risk of, of developing these things. Um, and, and really, we didn't used to do the um, reactor red DVD for everybody within induction and actually since we have there's been a far wider understanding of you know the importance of the maintenance of equipment and the checking of equipment um, uh, and people just taking a little bit more care of these uh, with these things and, and where and how to report them if they are not quite right or they are split or, or there is a problem with it and also they do need to do something about that if they find them. The final quality statement that we haven't included within the presentation, statement nine, is about the prevention of medical device related pressure ulcers. So we know that people that have medical devices can be at risk of developing pressure ulcers. Um, but the recommendation is that further guidance is needed on pressure ulcer risk assessment and preventative measures for people at risk. And at the moment, there is need for evidence-based guidance from NICE, and it's being developed in this area. So care planning um, is a huge chunk of what we do in helping people to have their needs met and so that all staff know who needs what in the best person-centred way and it's particularly important for pressure ulcer prevention. So it's really important to make a written care plan be that electronically or a physical copy within the person's notes and that anybody who's assessed as being high risk of developing a pressure ulcer has it reviewed on a regular basis. And I just noticed there's a question coming in about that um, pressure ulcer assessment and but the recommendations are that it can be done on a monthly basis or as the needs change. And uh, it's also really important to take clinical judgment with that. So people's needs may change on a daily basis, which means that their risk assessment needs updating on a daily basis. Just thinking about the care plan. The focus on the actions um, needs to be about preventing pressure ulcers for the problem developing. So that's building in the results and the risk of the skin assessment and how people can have the, their skin assessment undertaken. So I've talked previously about if people are helped um, to visit the toilet or with dressing, then that skin assessment can be taken undertaken at that point and it doesn't necessarily have to be a registered nurse that completes that skin assessment. It's only if they have concerns, so if they find a non-branching red area 
or even a red area and they're not comfortable with performing the blanche test, then they can report that to a qualified member of staff. The need for any extra pressure relief, so again, if that person has any um, a different mattress or a cushion that's not a different from standard issue, then this can be built into the care plan. And whether people need assistance to change that position, and again, it's really important for helping with the con consistency of care that positions change is documented so that people can understand what action they need to take at that intervention. I think it's important that um, changing somebody's position doesn't just have to be doing a turn. If somebody is assisted to go to the toilet, then that forms part of that repositioning process and taking part in other activities as well. It, it's not just going in and doing an action, it's trying to build it into their normal routine and the, into their activities they are giving. Yes, I would agree with that. Um, I think that it's important to to change people's positions, and it can be, become just part of everyday life. We we look at um, everyday occurrences within our care home settings, um, and, and I think that it is just as important to be when when. To not think I'm repositioning someone, but just taking them for a walk or going out in the garden with them, um, just moving them a, a person from a wheelchair or from an, an armchair, sorry, to a wheelchair is actually repositioning them if you're going to take them out to see a bit of scenery. I, I do think that, you know, it's, just moving them to the dining room table is repositioning someone, but we don't have to think about it as repositioning. We can just think about it as everyday normal life. Um, we would get up and go to the table at home, so why don't we do that within care homes? We should just be leaving people to sit in their armchairs with a table in front of them and have their meal on their, that table. We should actually be moving them to the table, um, the dining room table, not everybody wants to do that, of course, it is personal choice, but it is very important just in everyday life to be, be thinking, not thinking that you're giving pressure out of your care or, or repositioning people, but just doing normal everyday things will actually impact people's pressure areas. Yeah, absolutely, and it's about occupation as well, yeah. isn't it? So yes. opportunities yeah. to be occupied and yeah. do meaningful activities means that they are not just stationary in a chair or in a bed, that you know, they are moving about and keeping moving. Yeah, moving. Um, and we also do some um, a care planning training where people need it as and when, um, and that's offered to staff as well, extra to, to the reactor red things, but um, the care plan training is uh, can even be as a one-to-one -one session um, with one of our qualified staff, or it could be part of a, of a group session um, uh, too. Um, and this this guidance sort of is based on um, some prompts from our electronic systems, uh, but also using the tools available and the guidance that's out there, um, and making sure that it is um, you know quality-driven and, and person-centred um, as well. So just thinking about the care plan um, and any other conditions an individual might have that may impact on their pressure ulcer of prevention and um, just try to incorporate those into that pressure ulcer of prevention care plan. And then we've previously spoken about a person's own wishes and views and whether they understand the risks and can make that informed decision and if they can then that obviously needs to be included into the care plan. But if not then it might be that to use the Mental Capacity Act and assess capacity and things like that. So on the NICE website, um, there's um, availability of looking at the um, clinical audit tool, so they've developed clinical audit professionals of prevention in adults. Um, and there's 
also about how this information came about um, and practical steps to improve in the quality of care. And there's also a baseline assessment tool that you can have a look at and use. We've talked about the Stop the Pressure website previously, and there's a whole host of resources on here. It's a fabulous website, and it's available to everybody. Uh, it talks about different work that's being undertaken across the country on pressure ulcer prevention and the, it also will detail the date of the Stop the Pressure Day. They hold a day every year to try, some, try and raise awareness of pressure ulcer prevention and the management and treatment of pressure ulcers. I know actually a few of you are just typing about where to get information when you're still on paper base. It is a really, really good website. Um, uh, I'm sure that any of you that are uh, struggling to look at paper versions of things will be able to um, download and print off uh, some of the um, information that's on there, the resources that are on there. So, Sky have helped to develop the um, quick guide for social care about helping to prevent pressure ulcers. So this is an easy to read quick guide that details um, information based on the recommendations and guidelines from NICE. And that's accessible through this webinar using the link or you can go onto a search engine and they've got a range of the quick guide that they have developed. And within that quick guide, they also recommend the use of the um, pressure ulcers safeguarding adult protocol. So it's just a document that can help you um, to provide care and quick responses to people at risk of developing pressure ulcers. And it offers a process for the clinical management of harm removal and reduction where ulcers occur, considering if adult safeguarding response is necessary. So it's just a helpful document um, for managers to have a read through and um, to understand some of the processes. Just the nice resources so you can sign up for a social care newsletter um, that's available if you've not already got that uh, and again there's a link to the quick guides that I mentioned. So we've come to the end of the actual webinar, so we're just going to take the last 10 minutes to answer any questions that people have got. I think one of the things um, Wynne alluded to previously was that she's part of um, the international study which runs across the East Midlands actually within the United Kingdom called the LPZ study um, and that's looking at benchmarking for care homes in particular about a range of um, uh, needs for an individual and pressure ulcers and pressure ulcer prevention features quite highly on that. So if anybody is interested in the benchmarking process and particularly in the East Midlands, if you look on the East Midlands Academic Health Science Network, then you'd be able to get some further information about that. Yes, yeah, so I can see that somebody's just said about a recording chart um, and we mentioned that, that it's really important to get people to document um, when they are repositioning people and what side of it has to be quite particular and also within that um, document chart and uh, turning chart it, it's detailed on there how frequently somebody should be repositioned and any of their personal preferences as well. There's also a really nice copy of the repositioning schedule in Reactor Red, if anybody 
um, who haven't got one, um, but also have the mattress readings um, and things like that on that as well. Uh, again, if you are using paper forms, it's not part of your uh, e-care planning. Just a few people still typing, so we'll just wait to see if any more questions come through. Yes, I think actually, I've just seen that last comment about photo evidence. I think that's very important that we do take photos of any pressure damage or, or ulcers or any skin damage at all so that we can, um, so that we can see exactly what's happening uh, and maybe do a weekly photograph and um, that's what we, we we do in our homes we check we do a wound review every week and we actually record that on our nourish device and as, as a, speaking of the previous community notes we did use to take photos on a weekly basis and it was really helpful to then involve the tissue viability nurse because upload it onto their health records and it could be accessed remotely and also we were able to see let the GP see it as well and um, without having to take dressings down they were able to review the photo because you can't always guarantee